The Century Speaks. Local people look back over their lives in the 20th century. Program 4. Belonging. Uh, most people were in the same boat. Everybody were poor, really. And everybody was sane. And everybody were helpful. And everybody were neighbourly. My mother's friends were genuine. And if they really could help, they would help. They cried together and they laughed together. But they were genuine people, really. Everybody were good neighbours in them days. I can't remember any bad ones. You know, if anything were, anybody was ill or anything happened tragically or anything, it weren't just one family, take the whole street, everybody, hey, can I do it for you, you know, this sort of thing. My mother's friends were good friends. If my mother were having an upset, they'd, have, they'd be a good friend. They'd sit down and have a cigarette and talk it over. And anybody else on the street used to have particular people that were extremely special. We'd one on our street called Maggie Midgley. And if anybody had sent for Maggie at night, she'd laid somebody out, put pennies on their eyes and washed them down. And we had to have Maggie at night, she'd laid so-and-so out. Do you, do you know that? Did you know? It used to be a local housewife on our street, a local woman, Miss Midgley, old Maggie Midgley, and she would lay her out of her. So folk for about four streets used to send for Maggie to come and, if somebody had died, wash them down and shut their eyes and put pennies on their eyes and I particular uh, and they did it uh, in a nice sort of way not for money not for anything just for because they were neighborly people and they concerned and they grieved with whoever was grieving genuinely you know so it was a it was a genuine Rough and hard neighbourhood, but genuine people. I mean, it was a, it, it, right, honestly, it were hard. It were very hard. You never had any money, but you had a good heart, and your people worked together, pulled together. If somebody were 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 poorly, you'd go down with something and give them a bit of something. Even if it were only a mate pie, a summit, a bit of dinner, you'd left. You go down and say, here as a dinner for you because you knew they weren't so well and, and that sort of thing. The woman next door to us, she used to uh, a very good cook and every so often she'd bring a big jug of uh, pigeon soup in. Pigeons soup and it, it hit back of your throat like armour and they were that strong and all then it'd be a rabbit or something like that they were very good next door neighbours they brought this this food and it were always a, a big bowl of soup he said that'll put the air on your chest and all all right <laughs> if somebody were a little two, two or three doors away is there a, can i do it for you and all like that somebody bring you some of this I've, I've seen sometimes when it's happened that when you, you could have had three meals at one sitting, somebody would bring you a bit of tater pie, somebody would bring you a bit of rice pudding, somebody would bring you some stew, cow eel or, 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 or tripe and onions, a bowl of tripe and onions to you. You know, you left your doors open and, and uh, they, they'd come in, you know, if, you'd, if you weren't well, are you all right? Can I make you a cup of tea? Is there anything you're wanting? And it was general all over, was that? Uh, I can't remember door being locked, even at night. I cannot remember. There was my Auntie Susan and my Grandma and all his neighbours, they all... did. My Grandma and my Auntie Susan had come up uh, every other night for an hour and and talk how, how, how's this house mill going on and and whatever were going on in town or village and they they did they they, they did go camping one another because obviously there was no television and uh, there was a wireless at that time it was called relay run by plunkets on 
off main road there and you just do stations and but uh, they did there was a lot of visiting one another there was a lot of visiting I lived on a street in Cole where we had a tin bath my sister owned the bath but half a dozen local residents including myself used to borrow it so every certain night it was your night for the tin bath and so you walked it over your head and you might knock on the door and say, I'm taking bath cellar, or you might not bother and just borrow it bath because you knew it were your night and stick it over your head and walk out at backyard and up straight to your house wherever you're going with it, you see. So really, uh, they used to never think anything about it. You might meet somebody on your way up back straight and say, all right, Fred, hi, all right, Dave, bath night, David. Aye, it is, that's right, aye, we're having a bath. Aye, uh, good lad, and... Off you'd go, never thought out about it. I mean, if you saw anybody walking over back street these days with tin bath on the head, they'd think, what the hell's up with that fellow, wouldn't you? I've known it where we've had a bath swapped by somebody whose bath maybe has been inferior or thinner. They used to wear thin. And we, one night, I remember particularly one night when a chap took bath to use and came back shouting and playing, hell, who's made a all it bath? Well, nobody really had it. It had been swapped, we think, by somebody who had a bath with all in it. When they were played off, there'd be about five or six at band chaps to get their instruments, and they would be out for two or three days. In summertime, we used to come to Burnley, we used to go to over Bake at Rochdale way and busking, you know, and all like that. And I can remember coming home with uh, four pound in copper when it was two hundred and forty pound in them days. That pocket were walling down, that were walling down, my jacket pocket were walling down, and they all had that. They'd sleep anywhere sometimes, you'd sleep outside on time, time, but somebody nearly always fit you up in a house or somewhere like that to stop there. And, and you know, the, the people, the poorest people, was always the best givers in lots of ways. Sometimes you got it, went to a big house, they'd give you but they didn't want you in there like or not they didn't want to know really but the ordinary working people we went to we came to Summy Burnley and there were six of us and uh, this woman said is there any miners among you and they said yeah there's four of them and four of them might as well come in and I'll give you a feed and that woman had a big earthen her potato pie she said it's me my husband and two lads, he said, I'll find them somewhere else, you get this. And she gave us that potato pie there. I used to go to the butcher then, and uh, I didn't know there was anything wrong in it, but I got, she'd, mother would send me to the butcher and, say, and get a sheep's head. For, for That was our weekend joint. And there was sixpence, I remember how much they were. Because one day, I never understood this, but one day I went to the butcher at the co-op. Tom Neal, he was called in Ashton, worked for the co-op. I said, a sheep's head. And Tom looked at me and he had a joint of beef in his hand. And there was sawdust on the floor and he dropped this joint of beef on the floor. He said, oh dear, dear, dear lad, he said, I've dropped that now. What can I do with it? He said, I know what I'll do with it. So he dusted the sawdust off the meat. He says, have that, take that to your mum, he said. Uh, and uh, it was it's just, I'll charge you sixpence for it, the same. And we had this lovely joint of, uh, of sirloin. <laughs> yes, I remember that well, because it, it was a party for us, that. And uh, mum had this little tear. I said, what are you crying for? And she, she had this little... Wet eye, the kindness hurt her, you know, touched her. We used to go to Windybank every day to our work. We used to live like, well, my like, bottom of Langroyders. Yeah. We used to go to Windybank, down Exchange Street, round to Oak Mill, come back up Exchange Street, down Windybank. Well, they, they were them sort of folk, they all stood at the doors 
Uh, you know, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, talking away and shouting them on. Well, we went up that often that we knew nearly everybody by sight. Yeah. Now, at Saturday night, well, 17 year old, I used to go down on the 10 to 7 train to Nelson to the Imperial dancing, come back on the 10 to 11 train. We used to walk all up Albert Road and down Windybank. And there were Mary Ack, there used to be a woman they called Mary Ack, do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Her and her sister, they were all shouting and drunk and rowing, and we used to, and police were down in twos. They wouldn't and go we in used ones. to. They wouldn't go in ones. No, and we used to walk down Windybank at, it had been half past eleven, by the time we yeah. walked all up Albert Road, and down Windybank, at bottom of Langwood at that time at night, and we weren't bothered. We knew all them folk by sight. We weren't frightened of them. No. But police, they went down in twos. Yeah, they did. Yeah. It's true, is that? In the community I lived in, I have seen women fight. Clogs and sh into each other really fight. I have known several ladies who often would resort to a bit of kicking and violence. And Yes, oh yes, they weren't all. They were good friends, but bad enemies. And I've seen several where, in la later on in life, I've realised what, what it's been. Uh, but it was a different world then, when women were looking after kids. And if a fella had an eye for another fella's wife, or anything like that went on, they sorted it out between themselves, and it did go on. It's always gone on, hasn't it? It always will go on, I suppose. But in those days, it was more... Uh, rare it was fairly rare but when it did it's i've seen it come to occasional really bad blows in fact i remember as a little lad one day the biggest fight i'd ever seen as a boy in my life with two women and the whole bloody street was out the shopkeepers the whole community in that area were out to watch these two particular women who one's husband had been uh, well, they didn't call it affairs, in there, but he'd been bothering with with this other woman, and she'd found out he'd been dancing with her at Thivery Hall when he shouldn't have been. And I remember a hell of a battle going on with these two women, and uh, and I don't think they'd speak for years. That was the sort of thing. I remember after I could tell you the names, I know them exactly, but I mustn't. But I could tell you that they didn't speak for years afterwards. In fact, I wouldn't think I ever spoke again. Uh, I think one or two of the people just round about who had uh, daughters who still worked in the stripper works and never did anything else and never bothered to do anything else, I think they were a little bit jealous uh, of what I had done. I got out and got on. And uh, I remember the lady next door to us lived in the gable end and she used to sweep round all round the end of the house. And, uh, of course, everybody started work at eight o'clock, the slipper works, you see, and I went at nine. So I got my bus at 20 to nine, or quarter to nine, you see, when I go out. This particular morning, she's sweeping round, and she said, we'll sweep the road for the nine o'clock people. And I said, thank you, Mrs Ashworth. The sound of clogs um, was, is, is probably the most evocative sound of my childhood. We lived right on the main road, very close to uh, two big mills, four companies altogether uh, in these mills, four large companies in these big, big mills, employing hundreds of people. And early in the morning, this march of the clogs on the stone pavements uh, and, it, and it wasn't just a handful of people. These were people walking down the pavement either side, walking down the road. And it wasn't only um, uh, once a day, of course. They had to come home. But they also came home at lunchtime and went back after lunch as well. So the sound of clogs on um, stone sets and on uh, stone flags is one of the... Uh, great evocative sounds of my childhood, so much so that when if you, our family had no connection with the cotton industry at all, none. And so there was no real point in buying me a pair of clogs when I was a child, but I insisted 
and having a pair of clogs. And so did Stephen, because uh, all the other children had little clogs, and we thought we'd have little clogs as well, so we got them too. You knew quite a lot about other people, because, uh, I mean, you take Barn Oldswick. At one time in Barn Oldswick, there were 25,000 looms and 10,000 people. So everybody knew what everybody else was doing. They knew what everybody else's job was, and they knew what problems they faced in their job because they had the same problems themselves. It's a walking distance town, so people aren't insulated from each other. As they're going to work in the morning, they're passing each other, or they're walking together, or whatever. Um, when they're in the mills themselves, they're communicating with each other all the time. If somebody went to the toilet, the person next to her ran her for a loom. They never stopped. The next person ran her for a loom for her until mm. she got back. And that sort of thing. At breakfast, you broke up at quarter past eight, you went in at seven o'clock to start. Quarter past <coughs> eight, you took your breakfast with you. Quarter past eight till quarter to nine, we got breakfast. And everybody had their own cronies, and you used to take, everybody had a buffet on their alley what they called a weaver's buffet. You took your buffet, sat with your pals in their, at their looms, perhaps four or five of you, and ate your breakfast. Mm. And then back to your work back and so work. on. Lunchtime the same, you'd all meet up. Either have your dinner if you brought sandwiches or you went, sometimes I went home, but you'd only an hour. And I had to go from top of Colm right down to post office end mm. in an hour, in get an the hour dinner and, and get back, back again. again. Or we went in the market to these cafes. Cafes, yes. Yeah, yeah. And everybody helped everybody else. I mean, if somebody was having a bad time, the others yes. really Rally uh, did what they could. Mm. Yes, they did. Yes. Mm. There was a loyalty in the mill which doesn't seem to apply today. They, they, they had the feeling that these looms, although they belonged to the owner of the mill, they was theirs. And my mother and my dad, they used to take metal polish with them to polish the picking shafts. Because every every week they had to sweep the looms, twice a week they had to sweep the looms at Wednesday and sweep them again at Friday afternoon and Saturday morning. And they used to polish the picking shafts with metal polish and they used to take yellow stone to yellow stone the flags in between where they walked down the alleys because they felt a pride in them looms, they was theirs. They didn't want anybody else to touch them. They were theirs, although they weren't theirs really. They were belonged to the manufacturer. But once they got for a loom and got them how they liked them and shiny and clean, it was a, a pride which they had in the machinery. Now, when you came into the world, I understand you were born to the mill. Well, <laughs> it's rather funny, is this? My mother had been working at a little mill down Riverside called Calder Vale. And soon after I was born, she wanted to go back to work. So the only answer which she has told me happened was that when I was a few months old, she went back to work down Calder Vale and she took me away and put me in a wefting and put me under loom. And she's always said that that's why you love mills so much because you were brought up there. And that went on for quite a few months until my Auntie Susan started looking after me and then I didn't go at mill again till I was about seven or eight when I started going in for my breakfast. Breakfast time was quarter past eight till quarter to nine. They started at seven. So they said, right, you'll have to come in to mill for your breakfast. So every morning I'd get myself up when I was eight and uh, go off to Sam Holdings and stand in the doorway there. And once the mill started slowing down at quarter past eight, he now would go and sit on a, a, a little wood buffet at the end of the alley and my mother would go and brew four, uh, four pots of tea for his breakfast and we'd all have his breakfast uh, in the alley. And through going in like that early on in my life and also I used to go, when I came home from school, I would call in at the and I would go in the mill and I'd have an hour 
in in with me mother and my dad and they started learning me how to run the looms and so eventually by the time I got to 13 and 14 I knew how to weave and pull back and take ends up and put shuttles in and put cops on and pull pieces off and everything like that. Well, I think it's you were all in the same boat. I mean, most people worked at the mills and they helped each other. Of course, your grandma had to live round the corner or your auntie lived two doors away or your mother-in-law lived it and she got you the job at the mill or factory that she worked. And a lot of jobs were created by, uh, you know, passing people over saying, well, that person might be interested. There's a job of going there. And I think you became indebted. You look... Nobody seemed to think that they were massively above anybody else, and I think they all worked together. Uh, of course, as the older people die off and uh, society changes, the introduction of the motor car, I think one of the, um, the, the oh, well, this is not my view, this is my father's view, and he, I said he was very much in favour of technology, but the introduction of the automatic washing machine was one of the things that he said would break up the community because people would no longer have to put their their uh, clothes on, on the washing line and wouldn't meet each other every Monday on washing day, whatever day washing day was in those days. They to talk over the the backyard gate uh, rather than the garden fence uh, was one of the great institutions, but that doesn't exist because technology has changed. He was he was very progressive. Was Father. So progressive, for example, that he had the uh, first television um, in the village on, well, when I say in the village, the village of Harlsack is divided in two by the main road. He had the first television on the left-hand side of Burnley Road, and so the house is full of other people's children watching it as well. I mean, uh, nobody else had a television in the streets around, around us, and... Uh, I remember it to a tiny little, I think it was a nine inch screen with a, a big sort of magnifier in front of it, which I once knocked over and, and broke. It full of liquid it was and stained all the carpet. But what I do recall is that the front room in this house, incidentally, was a big front room. It wasn't a, a small room at all. So 20 children could easily get in and sit down and be sort of leaning on the back of the settee or sitting on chairs or stools or whatever. But the television would be turned on in the corner and the, the, I said there could be 20 or more children and on occasion mum would end up making tea for all of them and so on because they wouldn't go home because they didn't have televisions. One of the interesting statistics is that in about 1950, 85% of children and young people in this country had some connection with the church. That doesn't mean they went to church, but they had a connection. They were in the Scouts or the Youth Club or the Sunday School or something. See. And in 1990, that figure was 15%. Which, um, and, but that, that, that's actually true of every um, organisation in this country which involves participation. Um, almost everything which needed you to get off your bottom and participate reduced from 1950 to 1990 by that sort of percentage. Um, church attendance actually va fared better than almost any other organisation. Um, the reverse, of course, was that you know most of us never saw a television before the coronation. Um, people went to the ne you're not old enough to remember this, but most of us who are old enough to remember it saw television for the first time when we saw the coronation at, an, at a, a, the member of the family who happened to have a, have a telly. And we all went to their house and they closed the curtains. And if you were posh, you had a magnifying glass in front of the television that made it look bigger because it was only 12 inches. And, um, and we watched the coronation. No one had a television before the coronation. Now, I don't know, you know, you're considered to be eccentric if you haven't got at least one television set on you. Um, so, so as the graph for numbers of television shot up, the graph for people participating in life went down. And that's probably as significant um, a fact as anything else that's happened in my lifetime. We inherited the Wick Walks. And we set off on this solemn procession round the village. 
and it would be almost true to say not a soul saw us because they'd begun to get their cars and they were going out shopping in Cone and Burnley and Blackburn. A couple of years later we had the traditional sort of mission. Anyway, we set up this mission and we launched that mission with a procession in a completely different way. Um, one of our men, who was a Pole actually, who'd married a Scotswoman and she was a teacher in Cone and they were a splendid family. Their home was the kind of home where the door was always open. The home was in a bit of a muddle because there was never time to do much about it. But anyone, a child wanting help, an old person, a bereaved person, if they went in there, that woman was there to help them. It was a super home. But he was a craftsman as well. He built part of the parish hall roof, you see, and it's hands-on every time. He built the most beautiful, tall, tapering cross, about 15 or 20 feet high. We transported this cross in my van right down to the bottom end of the village at about 10, oh, well, I forget what time the mills loosed, as they say, it's when the mills closed, at about the time that the mills, the shift would be losing at something like 10 to 5 on a Friday evening. And with a handful of people, we started carrying this cross up the village street as the mills came out, double-decker buses standing all around the place to take the to people away. And our people, and I shall almost start weeping because I talk about it because it was so moving, our people, in their working clothes, came pouring out of the mills, grabbed the cross, and started to carry the procession up the road to the church. We must have finished up with 200 people in the procession. And, of course, all the other folks coming out and getting on the buses and so on saw this happening, saw the Christian community, saw the cross. And then that evening, um, a lot of them gathered and we hoisted the cross right up onto the porch of the church, which stood right out over the village. If I went down the street when I was little, um, everybody who I passed, I would know. They would all talk to me. And I could go in somebody's house and have a drink of milk and a biscuit, and uh, nobody would be worried because there were people who I'd known since I was little. Um, if my mum was looking for me, they'd say, oh, I saw her going down there, she's in so-and-so's house. Everybody knew everybody else. Um, women stayed at home, men went to work. So there was a huge female network uh, on streets and, and in any sort of area. Nowadays, of course, people don't even know who they're living next door to. They don't know who their neighbour is. They don't know who's across the road. And therefore, there's no support network there. There's nobody to help anybody else. I went to, to live in Oxford and expected it to be like it was in Burnley and was amazed to find that people didn't know each other. I thought it was very strange. And um, using the skills my dad had taught me, one lady, had, a car had broken down one morning and I went across and I said, can I help you? And she looked amazed that I first, well, I should say, can I help you? And then she said, well, I don't think you'll be able to, she said, because it won't start. So I said, well, it's because it's misty. She said, no, the car won't start. I said, no, it's, it's damp. But you just clean the spark plugs and, and, and it'll, you know, clean it up and it'll be all right. And she was absolutely amazed. And that woman clung to me for three years after that. And, and I couldn't understand why. I'd only, like, dry the spark plugs off for her. But she said, people just aren't friendly down here at all. Um, and I found that the people in the village that we lived in in Oxfordshire, the older people, were wonderful. They were very friendly. They were amazed that I would want to talk to them in the first place, but then I became really good friends with lots of them, not the commuters. The commuters that lived in the area weren't interested, but the older people, I had really good time, good chats with them. So it's the old communities, the new... The, the, the commuting to work and everybody being so busy, I think it's a great shame. Times have changed. Families used to move a lot less than they seem to do nowadays. People move for their jobs and so forth. And I think the whole of society has become more mobile. I mean, if I think back to my younger days, when children got married, they were fairly lived in the same town and were close to their parents and saw a lot of them. Many, many people now do move out of the area that they were originally in. And so I think there is generally throughout the country, I think a lot of people have had to do it for jobs. Certainly in the area that I was brought up, a lot of the industries that I knew as a young lad no longer exist. 
and so people either have to adapt to the new industry that come in or if they have a trade they have to move. There's still Phyllis Cunliffe there, there's my auntie Mabel, Furza Barker, we used to have players in there, Myra Marsden, she moved off Shakespeare Street, uh, Mary Warren, she moved and went down to live with her son, he was Peter Warren, he went and joined the Navy, he lives down in Portsmouth, so like this Barry Cook, he were alright, he, he was one of my mates as well, but we didn't play with him right much. But, uh, yeah, this, this still is that very small knit community, but uh, not like it used to be. There's drugs, um, derelict houses. I actually live on a street now where there's four or five people on it, that's all. So there's boards up. Um, it's just nothing to do, it's isolation. Um, nowhere for your kids to play whatsoever. There's no real places to go. I mean, the community centre, I mean, I don't know how many times a week that's open, but it's not enough. So kids are just basically smashing windows, as kids do. I mean, it worked like that when we were kids. It were, you had somewhere to go constantly, every night a week. You just don't. You just don't leave your, your doors or your windows open or anything. If you move, if I went in Margaret's, we have to lock our doors. You don't leave them open because somebody will have been in and gone with, with stuff and he's had three cars. I've had two, two vandalised, haven't yeah. I? A month stolen. Our own yeah. our own eight's house. What? Three oh, weeks. Yeah. I just moved into house. And the car got pinched. Oh, burled. have you been at Burdle then, right? Three times, yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's just an ongoing problem all the time. There's no there's no no ending shot at all. And as far as keeping these British gone concerned, it's gone completely through the window. Mm. You're, frightened of, you're actually frightened of even going in your own back garden and leaving your front door open. You have to lock it. If you go upstairs, you have to lock your doors. Because of that many sneak things in the area. Nothing's safe. Obviously, if I'd seen one of my neighbours getting broken into, I'd go out and shout to them. But it's all the people that you know anyhow that's doing it. And I watch her. Uh, if I seen somebody breaking into one of my neighbours, I'd go out and stop them or say something. I wouldn't let it happen, you know, I'd expect them to do the same for me if they seen it happening at my door. I'm very independent, I, I, I don't like a lot of help. I'm a good job too, because I don't get it. <laughs> but, yes, we used to come home from school and if any of our neighbours had died, we used to go and knock at the door and say, can we look at Mrs Leonard, or whoever it were, and it brought you up to face death. You couldn't go around and say, well, I don't know what it's like to be dead. I've never seen anybody dead. We didn't say that because it made it his business to have a look at them, to see them before they had their funeral, you know. Oh, it, it were common practice in those days. If I go anywhere, I'm, I'm glad to get home. Oh, yeah, I am. I'm glad to get home. Mm. What is it about home that you like? I like everything in my home. And I says to God, will you let me stop here till you take me to your cell? But I want to stop here and I've asked God, I says, God, will you let me stop here to finish? Here at Thane Shop, the best neighbour I've ever had. And there were a fella who used to live next door. He were a good neighbour, but they died. You know, he died. And he used to come in every day. I'd go in there at morning and he'd come in here at, at dinner time and the other shoes to go out shaking his shoulders were laughing. Everybody knows you walk down Cone. You can walk from here to our house, which is only just past town home. If you don't say hello to a dozen of people, you you want there's something wrong. Because you know everybody. Everybody's grown up with you. It's right nice to know. And if I see people that I haven't seen for a while, same thing. You stop and talk to them, you know. And we go dancing, me and the wives go dancing. And uh, like it was my birthday on Saturday, and people come up and give me a cuddle. They fetch me a little birthday cake, and one bloke bought me a pint. And that sort of people as you look forward to. Um, it's not just the fact that I've lived here all my life. It's the fact that through my parents, 
I know that they'd lived here all their lives and through the stories they tell me about their grandparents, you know, it goes back and back and back. So, you know, lots of people, uh, you can be walking down the street and see somebody and think, oh, yeah, I know that their granddad used to go out with my granddad. And it's the, it's the whole community thing. And I think it's still very much alive and kicking in an area like Burnley. And I think it's the valley concept, isn't it? You know, if there were hills around, nobody ever went over them. You stayed where you were, sort of thing. Although I, I must say that my grandfather came from Blackburn. <laughs> so we've got a bit of new blood there. <laughs> Thank you.